We've been going through this series the last couple weeks of the, over Advent, the wonder of Christmas. And this morning, the angel actress prepares for the nativity scene, modeled some wonderfully curious questions that engage our minds and hearts with some earthiness and texture of the Christmas story that perhaps we don't normally consider during Advent. How did Mary share the news of her pregnancy with her parents? What was she feeling? How did the divine message from the angel to this teenage mother-to-be impact her relationship with God? What did the command not to be afraid really do to the fears that Mary must have, had, must have been experiencing in those days of pregnancy? These are all questions that, that we can relate to in some way. As parents, as grandparents, watching our grandkids grow up, how would Mary's parents react to the news that her betrothed daughter, now pregnant, must have been a shock? And then to find out that the baby wasn't Joseph's. The questions, the concerns, the doubts, the wonder Mary and her parents must have had. Not to mention all the confusion that Mary must have been feeling as she, just a young girl of 13, was given this tremendous responsibility. As joyous as it must have been to been chosen. Again, like the shepherds and the wise men, she was least likely, the least likely person to be called upon to usher in the Messiah's coming. Matthew's gospel, as we saw last week, paints a unique picture for us about Jesus. As he begins with the genealogy of Jesus and the messiness of his family tree, Concluding with these words, Joseph, the husband of Mary, whom was born Jesus, who is called Christ. Matthew, from there on, focuses on Mary, not giving us any details about the census or traveling details, the inn where there wasn't any room to stay, not until after Jesus is born. Do we know where the birth took place? And not only because the magi, the the wise men, were coming from the east in search of Jesus. This morning, we focus on Matthew's account again on the birth of Jesus. Let me read Matthew 1, 18 to 23. This is how the birth of Jesus, the Messiah, came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph. But before they came together, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. Because Joseph, her husband, was, a faithful, was faithful to the law and yet did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, Do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel which means God with us. Sometimes stories are so familiar to us, aren't they? That we don't really wonder about them anymore. We take the story at face value, at its word, and give no other thought to it. We don't ask questions like the video did this morning. Often these are questions we can't fully answer. But being young once 
or as parents or even as grandparents, we can imagine and wonder what Mary and her parents might have felt. What the conversation was like around the dinner table. How Mary might have felt at such a young age. Engaged with her whole life before her, before her life began, told of this unexpected pregnancy. But we don't really know. We don't fully know. We can only wonder and imagine these reactions and feelings because we can relate to Mary and her humanness, her fears, her joy, her love, as she is the one highly favored to bring the Christ child into the world. She's chosen to bring the greatest gift the world has ever received. Again, one of the most unlikely people. Part of the passage we read, we read this morning is a quote from Isaiah 7.14. It's part of a prophecy. Emmanuel, God with us, is fulfilled in Mary's help. Matthew connects the prophecy of old with the family tree of Jesus. So let's have a look at the context of Isaiah and what it has to do with Jesus and his coming. Chapter 7 of Isaiah is about politics, warfare, about king, a king's refusal to listen to various prophecies. We don't know much about Ahaz or Razan or Pekah. And if we didn't know any better, we might think that these are characters in the latest Star Wars series. The chapter, chapter 7 ends more bizarrely with shaving of bodies, cows, curds, briars, the devastation of land, images of flies and bees, And their response to God's whistling. What in the world is going on? And how does Isaiah 7 relate to the coming of the Messiah? How are we to come to terms with Isaiah's prophecy of Ahaz and Mary? First, we know that Isaiah and Matthew that Isaiah and Matthew, that King Ahaz is the king of Judah. And thanks to Matthew, we know that his father is Jotham. Because if we flip back to chapter 1, we read that Jotham is the father of Ahaz, and Ahaz the father of Hezekiah. There is their connecting point. It's all part of Jesus' family tree, that messy family tree. And so chapter 7, Isaiah sets the scene for us. In Judah, it was a time of fear, a time when war was on every horizon. The southern kingdom of Judah was under attack by a coalition of the northern kingdom of Israel and Syria. Two unlikely allies stood at the gates of Jerusalem ready to besiege the capital. Those two unlikely allies had come together to ward off attacks by Assyria. Judah refused to join the alliance with Israel and Syria, trying to make a treaty with an even worse partner, Assyria. And even though Ahaz was part of the Davidic dynasty, Israel and Syria remained at the gates of Jerusalem, ready to pounce. Isaiah tells us that Jerusalem Isaiah tells us that Jerusalem and likely all of Judea, all of Judah were shaking like trees in the wind fearing the armies that were at their door 7 verse 3 Ahaz had walked out along the aqueduct of Jerusalem where Isaiah, Isaiah meets him God spoke through his prophet Isaiah to reassure King Ahaz that God was on his side. Be careful. Keep calm. 
don't be afraid. 7 verse 4, don't lose heart, King Ahaz. As great as those powers might be sitting at your gates, they are like smoldering stubs of firewood, God says. They threaten to ruin you, but it won't happen. In fact, God says in 65 years that the northern kingdom will be a shattered people. They will be no more. <coughs> Sorry. But Ahaz wants nothing to do with God. He wants nothing to do with God, what God has to offer him. He has his own plan. God even offers Ahaz to give him a test. Whatever he wants. To prove that God is on his side. And Ahaz turns him down. He was in a mess. And he had his own plan. Which is where the prophecy of Isaiah 7.14 comes in. Because Ahaz rejects God's help. A child will be born that will bring about dis the destruction of Jerusalem. Mary is highly favored, and the baby she carries is Emmanuel, God with, with us, who comes to save the world and restore the people of Judah and the people of the world. But the context of Isaiah is very different. Most commentators point out that the word virgin is probably not a proper or warranted translation of the Hebrew in Isaiah 7.14. It's likely just a reference to a Hebrew young woman who was marry of marrying age and who would have a child. And that child would be a sign, God with us. Of God with his people and God doing what God does. But there is no reason to think that Isaiah would have had any particular woman in mind, or Jesus for that matter. Rather, this is a general prophecy from Isaiah, which Matthew plucks out and makes specific for Mary and Jesus, as inspired by the Holy Spirit. This is a common practice for prophecies, and we see it throughout Scripture. A general prophecy in the Old Testament, transformed into a specific fulfillment in the new. Often focused around the Messiah. Isaiah 7, as one scholar notes, can remind us of God with us. But it also is a two-edged sword. For all of us from whom the idea of God's presence is a wonderful thing, there are always those who find it just east of wonderful, just a little bit off. I, uh, Ahaz in Isaiah 7 was that person. He had refused Isaiah's counsel, and therefore he refused God's help. Ahaz had his own plan. And he was not going to allow God to intervene. Even though the military was on his doorstep, he did not want God to mess things up for him. Starting in verse 13 of Isaiah, his tone changes. His voice changes. It's not the soothing, comforting way that we would hear Emmanuel today. But before we condemn Ahaz, we need to realize that we are all not that different. We all have our own plans. We have things that we want to do in our life. We have an idea of how everything will work out, don't we? Our health, our timing, and on and on. We have our plans Mary's life was tossed out the window. Her social life upended. Her marriage in jeopardy because of God's timing. The timing that he chose her to carry and to bring the Christ child into the world. It was not a smooth 
and simple plan for Mary. Isaiah was furious when he tells Ahaz that the child called Emmanuel would be born. And that before that child grew much, that God was going to do what God was going to do. And that was not good news for the king. That threatened everything that King Ahaz had planned. God with us is an amazing gift. But it comes at a cost. It means that we can't do everything on our own. We can't expect to lay out all of our plans and have them all go accordingly in a nice, needy way. They won't go in the way that the Christmas movies always go. It always works out in the end. God with us means that most anything could happen and most anything will happen. As we invite Jesus, the greatest gift, to take hold of our life. Today is the last Sunday of Advent. Next Sunday is Christmas Day. And each of the characters in the story chosen to walk down the path toward Jesus. The shepherds, wise men, Mary. No matter how difficult the journey, how socially devastating it must have been for them, they walk toward the light of Jesus, trusting that God had a bigger purpose, a better plan for whatever lay ahead for them. God always made the first move. God always makes the first move. 1 John 4.19 says that we love because God first loved us. We learn because God was willing to love us. We learn to love because God was willing to love us first by sending his son to show us how to love. God made that move to choose Mary. Chose Mary to be the mother of the only begotten son. In part because she trusted and was up to the task. Mary must have loved God with all of her heart, soul, mind, and strength. And lo God chose to love her back. God chose her to be the loving mother of Je Jesus. Even though it must have been a startling moment for her. When the angel Gabriel came and told her. Mary, who is called highly favored by Gabriel, must have been the one who engaged in prayers for the people of Israel. Who loved God and was committed to loving people with her whole life. But part of the nature and character of God is that he longs to be communicated with by those who love him. And he invites us into this amazing relationship. The infinite God invites the finite creation of humanity into this amazing relationship. To have it in authentic ways, to grow in our relationship with God, to be able to walk with him, to be curious and wonder and question. God does not back away from those things. It's okay to question and to wonder, to be curious about the situations and the places God puts in our life. And he's waiting for us to engage with him. As he invites us to wonder what he's up to in this world. He invites us to participate with all of our life. And to question and to wonder. And to struggle with it at times. 
what God is up to and how he is working in this world. In the C.S. Lewis book, The Voyage of the Dawn Treader, Gumpus is governor of the Lone Islands. The islands are technically under Narnia rule. But no one from Narnia has been there and to these far-flung regions of the kingdom in a very long time. Caspian, the young king of Narnia, is sailing through these regions for the very first time when he stops at one of the lone islands with the idea of stretching his legs with some of his friends. Not long into his hike, though, he realizes that this may not have been the best idea he's ever had. He begins to understand that things have gone their own way for a very long time. And that while he is still technically ruler of the islands, his actual presence may not always be that welcome. When Caspian finally finds someone he can trust, he asks if Governor Gumpus is even loyal to the Narnia kingdom. In words, yes. All is done in the king's name. But the governor would not be pleased to find a real live king of Narnia coming in upon him. And if your majesty came before him alone and unarmed, well, he would not deny his allegiance, but he would pretend to disbelieve you. Your grace's life would be in danger. You see, Gumpus was okay with the idea of the king of, of the king of Narnia. As long as he was left to rule his kingdom his own way. It was this real alive king of Narnia that he would have preferred to do away with. In the same way, the Jewish people and their leaders were fine with the idea of the son of David coming to take the throne. In fact, they loved that idea. They were waiting for it most expectantly. However, the real Messiah was something quite different than they had imagined. And instead of challenging the political oppressors, the king challenged them. And I wonder if it's the same for us. We love our, we love our Messiah, Emmanuel, God with us. At least we love the idea of him. Because mostly we are already have him packed away in a safe little historical display box. And the benefit of two millennia of theology. We have him pretty well figured out, don't we? But do we really know him? God with us. The Messiah. The real live king we serve. What about Jesus, who, while he cares deeply about our struggles we face, does not necessarily intend to relieve them at this time or maybe never during our lives? What about a Jesus whose first order of business might be bursting into our place of worship and setting things straight? A Jesus who is not willing to accept outward allegiance or praise or offerings without radical reorientation of our lives. No, it's, it's a real live King Jesus coming upon us to stir things up that we might just likely like to reject him altogether, as the Jewish le leaders did 2,000 years ago. Are we ready? As we move into this final week of Christmas, final week of Advent, as we anticipate all that the season has to offer, are we ready for a real live king to invade your life and mine? 
to call us to upend it and to follow him. If Mary, the wise men, the shepherds had been chosen, so we can be chosen to upend it. All that we have planned. God is calling us. The real live king is calling us. The greatest gift the world has ever offered is calling us to upend our lives for him. Are we ready to receive that kind of gift this Christmas? Let's pray. Father God, we ask that you would come anew, come afresh in our lives, and that we would be ready, not just to receive you, but to give you, because you are the greatest gift the world has ever seen, the world will ever know, and you call us to receive you and then to turn around and to give you away. May we do that this Christmas. Amen.